Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Evan Crane. So Evan is a doctoral student in my lab in the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab at Washington State University. His dissertation focuses on breeding and end use quality in quinoa and malting barley. Evan is especially interested in developing technologies for high throughput phenotyping for end use quality traits, as well as for developing interdisciplinary collaborations. So Evan has collaborations with scientists in China, in Australia, in Saudi Arabia, in Germany, and other places as well. His work focuses on the relationship between seed traits, such as color, size, and shape, and seed composition. And he's also worked in collaboration with international researchers to characterize diverse quinoa germplasm collections. Evan helped develop a near-infrared analyzer calibration for estimating whole seed quinoa end sample composition, specifically protein content and quality, and a seed scanning system using flatbed scanners. These tools support the WSU quinoa breeding and research projects and are available to collaborators interested in applying them to their research objectives. So Evan will give us an overview now of, of what he has done a lot of this is very exciting and has revolutionized our lab capacity. So please let's uh, give Evan the floor now and enjoy all the um, great information he has to share with us. Thank you. Great, thanks for the intro, Kevin. It was really good because it covers pretty much my whole presentation. So today I'll be talking about one example of how to develop a post-harvest phenotyping pipeline. I want to start by talking about how we define post-harvest phenotyping. It's just anything after the seed comes out of the field. So this could start with traits like yield and test weight, but it could also include everything up to processing characteristics, culinary or baking traits, and flavor. So our target traits are focused on the seed phenotyping these include some of the ones I've already mentioned, but also seed composition and especially protein content and protein composition. So today I'll be talking about how we developed what we call our nutritional phenotyping pipeline. This schematic represents the workflow and it includes some of our target traits in a little bit more detail. So today I'll be walking you through what this pipeline looks like and how we develop it. The pipeline always starts with taking a packing list from a seed lot, which includes specific information about what the samples are and converting this into QR codes. And these QR codes are what we use to track the samples through the entire pipeline. And what I'm showing here is what we can embed in the QR code. Anything here with a Q is embedded in this QR code. All that information is maintained in this image here. And then anything with an H is human readable. So this is customizable and you can embed many fields up to a certain point and you can also change what is human readable depending on what you would like to see on the samples. And we print these on Avery labels and stick them onto the bags. And we use this uh, unique file name to query data from the various stages in the pipeline. The first step after labeling the samples and assuming the seed is clean as shown here is to run this whole unprocessed grain on our near infrared analyzer. And I show the throughput for this here. So what this allows us to do is very quickly look at seed composition and it uses whole seed samples, which is important because it's non-destructive. And we can use small amounts from maybe 10 grams, but we can also use amounts up to around 300 grams. So if you're not familiar with how near-infrared spectroscopy works, one way to think about it is how our own vision works. So in this picture, we're able to discern the different shapes and structures present in this greenhouse. We're also able to pick out different colors of these quinoa plants. 
And that's because the light's reflecting off of everything in the image and we're processing that. And over time, we've learned that certain colors are associated with certain wavelengths. And we sort of take that for granted, but that's, that's what we're doing every day. We're, we, we've been trained to associate these colors with certain words and we're able to report that perception. And that's essentially what the near infrared analyzer is, do, is doing. It's using as part of the spectrum that we can't see to look at what's inside the seed. And so when developing a near infrared calibration, in theory that you can estimate any trait that you can correlate NAR spectra with. So there's actually myriad possibilities. And on the right here is a figure from this Foley article, which was published in an ecological application and it walks you through how to develop a near infrared calibration. And there's a really important point here, and that's that in order to have a robust calibration, you need to have the total spectral variation in your population represented. The calibration can easily predict new samples if it has examples of spectra that it's going to be looking at and trying to predict parameters for. It's also important to understand how the quality of data meets your needs. And I'm gonna talk about that. And this process is an evolution over time. As you find outliers or samples that your calibration isn't able to easily identify, you're going to want to add those into the calibration. And that's done through collecting data on the sample composition through traditional analytical methods, which are expensive, time consuming, and they are destructive as well. So that's what we're trying to avoid with this near infrared calibration. This is a schematic of how we developed our own calibration. And it's in three phases currently, we're in the third phase. And I've just given one parameter as an example, and this is protein to show the evolution over time. And I'm just showing the, the range in protein values for the reference data. So this is what was measured in the lab and we're using to pair up with the spectra so that we can use this core set of samples to predict new samples. So you can see that we've added samples over time and that's because when we received the machine, there were only 27 samples in it. And when we tested it with our own quinoa samples grown in Washington state, we found that it, didn't perform well when tested in this way. So we added our own samples to it. We also added reference data for a complete amino acid profile. And it worked well for our samples, but when we started to analyze samples that were grown in new environments, like in China and Germany and Australia, it didn't perform well when tested in this new way. And so we added some of the samples from Australia, and I'll talk about how we selected those samples. And what I wanna just highlight here is that we're able to pull the range of protein content in both the low and high direction. And I'll show a visual of what this looks like. So for version three, where we are adding the Australian samples, what we did was we ran close to a thousand samples on the machine using the second version. And then we took all that spectral data, which is multivariate. So it goes from 950 nanometers to 1650 nanometers, and it's measuring wavelengths every five nanometers. And what we did was a principal component analysis on that spectral data. And then using the Kennard Stone method, we, were so, we selected a representative sample. And what that method essentially does is it takes the two furthest away points, and then it calculates the distance from those two points to every other point, and selects the point with the largest difference from those two points. So it's bouncing around and selecting samples in an iterative process. And another way to look at this is with this graph here, which shows the distance of these new samples to the nearest neighbor in the calibration model versus the Mahalanobis distance to the partial least square regression. So you can see we have samples out here that were very much novel. There weren't any samples that we had previously recorded that had similar spectral data. 
And I apologize for the quality of this figure here, but what I want you to just focus on is the difference between these two colors. So these lighter colors represent the data points in version one. And then in version two, we've added these new data points. So you can see we're pulling this regression line down in terms of the range of the crude protein content. And we're also filling in the regression line. So these are the, these are the neighbors in the calibration that when we have a new sample, we're gonna be trying to predict the composition of that sample using similar spectral data that the machine has been trained to associate with certain compositional components. This is the same idea going from version two to version three. And I wish that they were colored to show the difference, but just note that we're now adding samples on the extremes. And so when we move from version three to four, which will happen over time, we're gonna be wanting to add samples in this range down here to fill out the regression line and also in this range up here. And this is an evolution that will occur over time. We're gonna to continue to improve on the calibration and it's gonna be more robust over time as we introduce new samples from different environments, different years, different germplasm. What I'm showing on this side are different calibration metrics. And I'm just showing a few here that we used when evaluating version three, our current version of the calibration. So I'm showing the range, and this is the range in the reference data. So it was measured using the analytical methods, the RPD-CV, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then the, the R squared of the CV, which is the cross-validation. And that cross-validation process is essentially leaving some samples out of the calibration, creating the model with the remaining samples, and then trying to predict those samples and comparing the predicted value to the value that we've already measured in the lab. And I've sorted this by RPD. And if you aren't familiar with that measurement, it's the standard deviation of the reference data over the standard error of the cross-validation or prediction. So if you want to think about this visually, on top of the equation, we have our standard deviation. So we can look at a normal distribution. So we want that to be really wide. We want to have a nice range, and we want to have a lot of samples spread out across that range. And that's compared to the standard error of the cross-validation. And we want this number to be low so that overall RPD will be a high value. Now, the good question is, how high do we want it to be? And I'll bring your attention down here to these RPD values. And so an RPD value around three to five is useful for screening. So if we think about the, these amino acid samples, our RPD value is in that range. So this might be useful for separating quinoa breeding lines in terms of classes. So our high, medium, and low in terms of amino acid content. When we have an RPD in the range of five to eight, we're approaching what is considered more of a quality measurement. So what we're seeing on the machine is actually what we might get if we were to run it using those traditional analytical methods. So for moisture and crude protein, we're approaching what we could consider a quality measurement. And so in version three of the calibration, we can rely on this a little bit more for crude protein measurement, while for amino acids, it's more of a practical tool for just screening and separating samples into those classes that I mentioned. So after running samples on the NAR, we take a small subsample from the sample. And I'm showing what this system looks like. So we use the barcode scanner here to enter the sample ID information. And then we use an analytical balance with a USB interface to push the sample data to an Excel spreadsheet. And for this project, we are actually measuring both yield because they were single plant samples and the subsample weight. So we, we typically take a subsample, excuse me, from one to two grams. And I've listed some of the equipment we use here and you can do this other ways, but since we're using a lot of samples in the pipeline, we wanted to try and automate the sample data information so that we can lower the risk of having any human errors 
entering IDs or entering weights. The next step after the subsample is to take that subsample, which goes into a packet with a new QR code to identify it, and then image it using these flatbed scanners. And before we had this system, we were just using one scanner hooked into the computer and then saving that image, manually labeling what that image was in terms of the sample ID, and then going through feature extraction of that image to get our seed phenotype. And so what we've done with this system is we're using a Linux system with a Python script that allows us to run eight scanners currently, although you could use more if you want. We're running eight scanners simultaneously and it's all triggered by those QR codes. And I'll show a video that illustrates this. So we're automating much of this process and we've really increased our throughput and we're lowering the risk of any errors again for the entering of sample information. Here's some of the equipment we use. These Epson Perfection scanners go for around $70. So it's an expensive input up front, but we're saving a lot of money in terms of hours spent by people to gather these phenotypes. And that's a central theme to this whole pipeline is that we're saving money and time so that we can analyze more samples over time. So here on the left is an example of what the scanned image looks like. So we have the seeds scattered onto the image here. We try really hard not to have them touch, but what this is showing over here with the mask image or the image that's separating the objects, which in this example are seeds from the background, these are actually touching which is okay, the algorithm can work through that. And the data that we're getting out of here is for each seed, we're measuring the major and minor axis, which is used to calculate area and eccentricity for each seed, which is then used to calculate both mean and standard deviations for the sample and the seeds. We're also able to analyze the number of red, green, and blue pixels for each seed, and that gives us a measure of the color. And then the algorithm goes through and it counts all of the seeds. And since we already know the subsample weight, we can use that subsample weight and the count to come up with our thousand seed weight. And when we compare our thousand seed weight counted on the scanner, which is shown on the y-axis here, to the hand count where we've, we have someone going through and literally counting a thousand seeds and then weighing them, we have a pretty good relationship between those two methods. And we do need to add more data points to this to better understand the relationship, but it meets our needs and it saves a lot of time. Lastly, I wanna talk briefly about a new stage in the phenotyping pipeline that we're developing, which is this energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence machine. There's a description here from my lab mate, Julian Kellogg, on how it works. Essentially what it can do is measure both the content and composition of minerals in seed samples. So we're really excited to apply this and start to look at how these various traits are all related so we can better understand the nutritional composition of different quinoa samples based on their genetic variation, environmental variation, and year-to-year -year differences. So I'm gonna pause quickly, and I'm gonna share a photo that's just walking you through the phenotyping pipeline. And then I'll come back to the presentation and, and finish up.
All right, well, I hope you all enjoyed that little video, just walking you through the process. And I had to speed it up because I'm a little bit out of practice uh, measuring those samples. Our hourly employees, our student employees, they're really quick. And so I had to speed it up to try and match what, what they're likely working through. So with that, I would just like to quickly say that post-harvest phenotyping will really depend on how you define it. And I showed a lot of the process in our pipeline that integrates technology. And you can still accomplish a lot of post-harvest phenotyping with basic tools. So you can use a ruler to capture seed size. You can use calipers to look at seed width or the major and minor axis. Uh, you can use just visual cues to phenotype color. And so don't be discouraged if you see this and you think you need all this technology in order to do post-harvest phenotyping. You can still accomplish it with basic tools. We've just added technology to help increase our throughput. And we're very fortunate to be able to do that. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the collaborators. A lot of our seed came from Mark Tester, David Wu, Mark Warrington, also Dylan Sarand in uh, Germany. And then Nathan Miller for his help with the seed scanning. And he developed the Phytomorph toolkit that we use for both the QR codes and for the algorithm to get our seed phenotypes. And this is all through Cybers, which is a free online service. So if you're interested in applying this to your own research, please do reach out and we can help get you set up. And Nathan is a great collaborator, very willing to help and make the, the entry into this more accessible. Also, Yang Hu, who was integral in developing the Python script so that we were able to adapt Nathan's code to our own system. And then the folks at Pertin Instruments for working with us along the entire calibration for the NAR. And then our funding sources shown here. And with that, I hope I've left enough time so that we can answer some questions. Thank you for your attention.